حامدا ومصليا ومسلما Respected listeners, we live in an environment where parents are called by their first names, where children throw tantrums when they are not given what they ask for. When their demands are not met, children throw tantrums. And when these very same parents who brought these children into the world, who fed them, who worked 12-hour shifts for these very same children, when those parents reach old age, they are forgotten and placed in old people's homes. A nicer way of saying this, how many non-Muslims, those who don't believe in Allah on the last day, like to package this, is retirement homes. Retirement homes is another name of forgetting the ihsan of your parents and leaving them to be cared for by people who have no affiliation, no connection, no ta'alluq, no lineage with your parents. But bihamdillah ta'ala, my young friends, we belong to the faith of Islam, a faith which teaches you and I that even if your parents are non-Muslim, you show them the utmost form of respect. I present to you the story of the famous companion of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Huraira, radiallahu an, open Sahih Muslim. His mother was a non-Muslim. He invites her to Islam. And she makes statements which were negative in regard to the Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam. May our lives be sacrificed for the honor of the Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam. Abu Huraira starts to cry and he runs to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The point of this hadith is the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his Mubarak Izzat, his name, was misused by the mother of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu. However, the respect of his mother was such that Islam had taught him that despite saying something negative about my Habib, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he did not utter anything in return to his mother. He went to the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He started to cry, Ya Rasulullah, I gave dawah to my mother. She said derogatory terms in regards to you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Rasulullah, my heart can't take it. Make dua for her guidance. The messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, lifts his hands. O oh Allah, guide the mother of Abu Huraira. My friends, when the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, lifts his hands to the sky to ask Allah, wo haat khali nahi lorte. Those hands do not return empty-handed. The shan of our Habib, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he lifts a stone in his hand, and the stone says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. The shan of our Habib, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is when he lifts his eyesight to the heavens, Allah ta'ala changes the qibla. When he lifts his finger to the moon, Allah ta'ala splits the moon in half. And now when the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, raises his hands up to the heavens, Ya Allah, guide the mother of Abu Huraira. Who? Who is the mother of Abu Huraira? Just five minutes earlier, she said negative remarks about the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yet five minutes later, he alayhi salatu wasalam, is making dua for the mother of Abu Huraira. Wa nabiyyo bi rahmat laqabbani wali. Abu Huraira runs home. He finds that the door of his house is locked from inside. And the sound of water is coming from inside. His mother says, Abu Huraira, wait for me, I'm coming. She finishes her ghusl, she dons her clothes, she opens the door, and she says, Oh Abu Huraira, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu rasul. 
One dua of the Messenger alayhi salam changed the taqdeer of this woman. But Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu was instructed, she is your mother. She may make negative remarks about Habib sallallahu alayhi salam. Lekin tumhe chup rehna hai. This is the teaching of our Sharia. That unless your mother and your father command you to disobey Allah, la ta'ata fi makhluqin fi ma'asit al-khaliq. As long as your parents command you to obey Allah or something within the realm of Sharia, ah, you have to obey. And if they command you to disobey Allah, you cannot disobey Allah, you decline politely. And friends, all of us are sat here today with one wish, one goal, that may Allah grant us Jannah and allow me to explain a hadith of Sahih Muslim. And our brothers in Tabligi Jamaat often quote this hadith. <coughs> that Huzur alayhi salatu wasalam said, <coughs> whenever a gathering of dhikr takes place, a gathering in which Allah is remembered, the angels gather, they find that gathering, they climb on top of one another. And Allah asks, where have you come from? Wa huwa a'lamu bihim. Allah knows, but Allah asks, O oh angels, where have you come from? And they will say, O oh Allah, we have come from Islamic Center Leeds, the second annual youth conference. And these people are engaged in your dhikr. O oh my angels, what is it they ask for? O oh Allah, they ask for your jannah. What do they seek refuge from? O oh Allah, they seek refuge from, from Jahannam. <coughs> Allah says, make an announcement for every person present in that gathering. I have granted him my paradise, saved him from Jahannam. And every person who attends the gathering, I announce his forgiveness. My friends, these gatherings are not normal gatherings. These gatherings are where Allah announces the forgiveness of every person who attends. So our maqsad of being here, our purpose of being here, is Allah through his fadl, his grace, his mercy, grants all of us his paradise. But friends, open Tirmidhi and Ahmad, the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam said, Jannat lies beneath the feet of your mother. My young friends, if you want Jannat, you will find Jannat beneath the feet of your mother. In the happiness of your mother, in the khidmah of your mother. How many of our youngsters today, they leave a home, they leave home in such a state that their mothers are crying. And friends, all of us should strive to attain the dua of our parents. Dua is an essential part of Islam. The hadith of Tirmidhi, Ad-Dua Mukhul Ibadah. Dua is the essence of worship. Am I moving on too much? Dua is the essence of worship. My friends, what is the purpose of Dua? What is the purpose of Ibadah? Every Ibadah you and I do, it is to demonstrate to Allah, O oh Allah, we humble ourselves before you. The purpose of worship is to humble yourself before Allah. However, it's possible that somebody comes to five times Allah in the masjid and now he feels arrogant that I'm better than most of the youth in Leeds because I pray all five Salah in the masjid. Sometimes ibadat, worship can make a person arrogant. So Allah gave us dua that a person sits and he places his hands out and he begs Allah. My friends, no person can beg and yet be arrogant. The falsafa and the philosophy behind dua is to humble ourselves before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we need to make dua a part and parcel of our lives. 
make it a habit to talk to Allah. How many of us have been reading behind our Imams? May Allah preserve them both. And may Allah enable all of us to the to the Qadr. My friends, ulama ki Qadr is a very big thing. Those ulama who are our local ulama, our local Imams, unki Qadr kare. Many of us have been reading behind these Imams 15, 20 years. And when the Imam makes dua, we say Amin. But if one day the Imam was not to make dua after the first prayer, how many of us could last our dua more than one minute? Why is it we have not become accustomed to talking to Allah? In Taraweeh, Khatme Quran, after half an hour, Imam Sahib still making dua, and our thought is on Eid day. When a person leaves home, make dua in your heart, Oh Allah, I have left home seeking risk to protect my family. Oh Allah, I am going to buy groceries for my family. Take me to the best shop. In your heart, every moment of your life, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My friends, within a short amount of time, a person who makes it a habit to talk to Allah throughout his life, he, in a short amount of time, will become a friend of Allah. Wow. Hazrat Thani Rahmatullahi, he writes, okay, why do we make dua to Allah if Allah knows what we need? <coughs> Allah knows what we need, yet we still make dua. <coughs> Hazrat Thani Rahmatullahi, a great scholar, the Mujaddid of the last century, He writes, when we make dua, it's not to inform Allah of our needs. Allah already knows. But the purpose of dua is to show to Allah that we consider ourselves as slaves. This is dua. Make it a habit of making dua. But friends, all of us strive to get the duas of pious people. It's very important. Your friend goes for Umrah, bhai, aap ja rahe umre ke liye, don't forget me. <coughs> Let me tell you, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, in the hadith recorded by Imam Tirmidhi Jami' mentions, there are three du'as that Allah accepts, and there is no doubt in their acceptance. Number one, a person who is oppressed. Number two, a traveler. Ajiba. In the masjid after namaz, do teen min ka dua. In the masjid after namaz, we make a dua for two, three minutes. And when we are in suffer, and we stop at the airport and we two rakats first, straight away before dua, we get him going. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us that when you are a traveler, your dua is accepted. This is a gold mine, my friends. A mazloom, oppressed. Number two, a traveler. And the third person whose dua is accepted is a father's dua for his child. How many youths are here today? And not just youth, even the elders, those in their 40s, whose parents are still alive, go up to their mother and father and say, make dua for me. My friends, not me, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is informing the Ummah that the dua of your parents is accepted for you. There is no doubt it is accepted. And every person today is concerned about their sustenance. Every person today is working two or three jobs. Imam Sahib Guzarani Yota. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us 1400 years ago in the hadith of Bukhari, if a person wants increased blessings in his risk, in his sustenance, and a longer life, then keep the tithe of kinship. If you 
want blessings in your business. Today, 14 year old children, their main concern is Mom, Dad, I want to leave school. I'm going to start my own business. Trading, drop shipping. Every kid sees TikTok stars and thinks that this is the way forward. My young friends, if you really want to become rich and have an ample amount of money, then be good to your parents. The Messenger alayhi salatu salam promised, if you are good to your family, Allah will lengthen your life and increase your sustenance. And throughout the Sunnah, my friend, we find the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam encouraged the Ummah to be good to their parents. There's a hadith in Bukhari where a Sahabi comes to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Ya Rasulullah, I want to go out in the path of Allah. Oh my companion, are your parents alive? Yes. And the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam instructed the companion, Oh my companion, your striving out in the path of Allah is service to your parents. <coughs> Serve, service to one's parents, my friends, my young friends, is also part of striving in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My young friends, as parents get old, naturally they become short-tempered. Illness, doctor's appointment, afsos ki baat ye hai. 40 years ago, siblings would fight with one another, okay, who will have the honor of doing khidmah of his parents? The brothers would argue, okay, I want this honor. The other brothers would say, no, it's my, it's my duty. I'm the youngest, I'll stay at home. And today, fast forward to 2024, siblings are fighting, Kibai, I work 9 to 5, you work from home, you look after mom. Today we have taken the khidmah of our parents of the burden. And my message to the youth, how many of you, when in the company of your parents, surrounded by your family, are constantly snapping your friends, Okay, I'm just with family, I'll meet you in five minutes. <laughs> when we are in the company of our parents, our heart is with our friends. I'm just stuck with family, stuck with family. I'll be there in five. And when we are with our friends, hours pass by and not one fourth of our parents. Okay, through my social media, I have, I have quite a few social media, TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, low push thing. Okay, why do you have all these? I go, it's because I want to connect with the youth. Parents complain. Okay, Imam said, our child goes out for four or five hours at night. We ring him, he does not pick up. How many of our youngsters see the number of their mother and father on their phone at 10 p.m. at night? And as soon as they see their parents' number, they turn the phone down. And the friend asks, who's ringing? And their words are, my mom is bashing my line. And that laugh and snigger is a testament that you know what I'm talking about. How on earth, my young friends, could we ever use such language towards our mother who cares about us and why is he sitting at home? And this is why the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith recorded by Bukhari, shall I inform you of the greatest of sins? Number one, to make partners with Allah. And number two, being undutiful to your parents. 13 years, 14 years ago, when I first started teaching Makta, a parent came to me. His son was my student. The father was a hard worker. He worked as a manual worker in a difficult job, packing. 
He had one son, one child, one son. And those of you who have, one, who have sons and only one son and one child, we know generally in homes, those sons are spoiled. This young man, his father had put out all of his stops for his child. He had paid for his child to go to a private school 5,000 pounds a year. Whatever that child wanted, that father got his child. The father rings me, Imam Sahib, can you please come to my home? So I went to his home. 16 year old child, 16 year old child. And the father goes to me, Imam Sahib, I have given my son everything he's asked for. But today in anger, he punched me. Muslim child. And those ulama here who teach maktab will know that on a regular basis, parents come to imams and come to maktab teachers and complain that my child verbally and physically abuses me. And this is where we are heading. But my young friends, this is a very dangerous situation to be in. There's a hadith in Jami' al-Saghira of Imam Suyuti, rahimahullah ta'ala, the study in Sahih. And when the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, went on Mi'raj, he heard the qirat of a Sahabi in Jannat, bearing in mind this Sahabi was still alive in Medina. And this Sahabi's name was Haritha bin Nu'man. When the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was in Jannah, he heard this Sahabi's Qirat in Jannat. And he asked, her, what is the reason that this Sahabi's Qirat is being amplified in Jannah? And the angel remarked that this Sahabi has served his parents so well, whenever he reads Quran, Allah Ta'ala makes the inhabitants of Jannat listen to it. Our young children, youth, 14, 15. It's our job to assist our mother and father at home. Help your father with the household chores. Help your mother with the household chores. Now, how many of our youngsters, they earn money? 20, 21. And they don't assist with the rent with the bills at home. Many of our youth today, you ask them, how often do they get a haircut? Imam Sahib, I get a fresh trim every week. 25 pounds with a Turkish barber. Then you ask the question, beta, kharcha at home, paise koni. The amount of parents who have complained to me, Imam Sahib, my child works a full-time job. He does not assist in the bills at home. Yet the same youngster, when he goes out with his friends for a meal, and the meal comes to 80 pounds, he will be the first person to pull out money. Lekin, when it comes to giving money at home, it becomes the boat. My young friends, the best place you can spend your money is in your parents. And that's why in the hadith of Ahmad, a sahabi comes to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Rasulullah, my father asks for my wealth. And the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Anta wa maluka li abik. You and your wealth belong to your father. All you have to do is go on Google and type in the cost of raising a child in the UK. And you'll find by the time you've turned 18, your parents have spent in and around 100,000 pounds. Just bringing you up. Bills, expenditure, the amount of time you take on work. And that same child, when he turns 18 and he's got a full time job, it becomes difficult for him to give money at home. 
I say, my young friends, that if you can, if you can, and this will be a great honor for you in Qiyamah, if you are able to retire your father early, then do so. Every child will aspire that I want to earn enough money that I can make my parents retire. But at the very least, as children, assist your parents in paying the bills, in paying rent. Your children, they move out, get their own home, they're married. And now, once a week on a Friday, all the siblings get together at the parents' home and eat food. When did we have in our Sharia that we fix one day a week and only one day a week we go to our parents? Or who we, bichari, we make our own cook? Is it not time that we say to our parents that minimum once a week come to our house? Ham to be khana chalayenge. There should never be that I only go to my parents once a week. A client came for massage last week. He lives one mile away from his parents, one mile. He said, Morana, I work from home. My wife, she drives the car. We have one car. For three weeks, even though my parents live in the next town one mile away, I have not been to my parents. And this is not a youngster in the street. This is a half of the Quran. Bashara, <coughs> somebody who prays five times in the Mazda Namaste. For three weeks, he has not seen his parents. <coughs> <coughs> How many of us take our parents on holiday? <coughs> you know, we have a family holiday, we take our wife and kids. But if you take our parents, you know, they'll be difficult. The holiday will become a holy day. We should aspire. Just as we take our, our children and our wife on holiday, we take our parents on holiday. We do the khidmat. <coughs> How many of you have heard the story of Alqama? <coughs> Has anyone heard the story of Alqama? Yes, I have a the story of Alqama, many of you have heard that there was a Sahabi by the name of Alqama and when he was passing away, he was unable to recite the Kalima. And the reason was because his mother was not happy with him. Is pe ek even though many ulama have written that a person who disrespects his parents he will not be able to recite the kalima at the time of death. However, this story in regards to al qama is not proven. Many of our speakers and many bayan that we hear often quote the story. This story is not proven in the message of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they say it's against the Shah Sahabi. And friends, our parents have a right to be loved. How many of us have gone home and kissed our parents before him? The youth today binge watch Urdu Rola Usman. The very least you can learn in this series is the respect they have for their parents. I'm not going to advocate watching anything. Lekin, whether I say watch it or not, no one's going to stop anyway. But at the very least, if you want to take one lesson, the lesson you should take is respect for your parents. <laughs> now generally what happens is when an Imam discusses the rights of parents, parents become alert and children fall asleep. 
So now I'm going to briefly discuss the right of children. Like I request the parents to stay awake as well. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith recorded by Imam Muslim that your child has rights over you. Now before birth, what are the rights of our children? The first right of our children is that we choose the right spouse. Because the spouse you choose, the husband you choose, he is going to be the father of your children. The wife you choose is going to be the mother of your children. The first right of our children is choosing a good parent for them. Secondly, Science tells us that whilst in the stomach of the mother, by the fifth month, children can start detecting noises. And this is why our ulama recommend and encourage that sisters throughout pregnancy listen to the Quran. In many homes, cases of domestic abuse, where there's constant shouting between husband and wife, this is going to have a negative impact on the child whilst in the stomach. <coughs> the next right of the child, as per the hadith of Tirmidhi, is to give adhan in the ear. And in other narrations, to give iqama in the left. This is the first right of the child. That when the child enters dunya, the first thing he hears is the name of Allah. And every male here should know the Adar Iqam. Last year I received a call. Okay, Imam Sahib, Mujhe Azan nahi aati. I don't know how to give Azan. Can I play from YouTube? Every father should know the Adar Iqam. <coughs> now, <coughs> some have said, that the hadith that pertain to giving adhan in the right ear and the left ear iqama are weak. <coughs> and this is a common objection. Very briefly, Imam Tirmidhi in his jami has mentioned that the ta'amal of the ummah, that despite there is weakness in the hadith on this topic, but because the ummah has continued to practice this, this strengthens the nation. So the ummah for 1400 years, have practiced adhan in the right ear and iqama in the left ear. The next sunnah, I'm not going to go through all the sunnahs, but the next sunnah is tahniq. Tahniq is to rub the inside of a date on the cheek or the top part of the mouth of the child. Sunnah. Now, there's an article on the BBC website dated 25th September 2013. Uh, SubhanAllah, this is the beauty of the Sunnah. According to experts, a dose of sugar, so Khujur also has sugar, a dose of sugar given as a gel rubbed into the inside cheek of a child is an effective way to protect premature babies against brain damage. 1400 years ago, Huzur -Islam gave the Sunnah, the experts are saying today it protects a child from brain damage. And one of the greatest rights is to name our child a good name. As per the Hadith of Muslim, the best names are Abdullah and Abdul Rahman. You know, with the new generation, the new parents, they're always looking to give their child a unique name that nobody else has. Now, someone wants to name their child Adhan, somebody wants to name the child Iqama, and I don't want to his name was Falak. I was thinking, yeah, really, what they read in the Quran and choosing our words in the Quran. Bear in mind that when we choose a name for our child, it's important to, have, to reflect a good meaning. And always ask ulama the meaning of the name of our child. We don't have to stand out. Those basic names that we've had for 1400 years work. 
And my friends, tarbiya of our children is very important. And that's why in the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim, the father has been likened to a shepherd who is in charge of his flock. Though a father's main duty is to provide for his family, but also nurture his family, give time to your family. You know, 40, 50 years ago, our grandparents and parents, they worked two, three jobs. Why? Because they need to provide for you and they need to provide for their brothers and sisters and aunties and uncles in Pakistan. So those parents had no time for their children. But many parents who worked 20, 30 years like this, when their children grew up to 20, 25, and they did not have a meaningful connection with their children, they regretted their working hours for 30 years. And friends, it's vital we give time to our children. <laughs> Living in the West, we need to become the friends of our children. Because if we do not become their friends, then social media influencers will become their friends. There's a hadith in Bukhari where the messenger وسلم, said, Fear Allah and treat your children fairly. Now, psychologists have termed a word, coined a word, called middle child syndrome. Middle child syndrome. And the idea is, and, and the irony is that I'm a middle child at home as well. The, I, the issue here is that it's often believed that the child in the middle, if you have three children, the second child, are often neglected. You either give the most love to the eldest or the most love to the youngest. The middle child is always left out. Whereas the Messenger وسلم, instructed us to fear Allah and to treat our children fairly. And mistreating one child or giving preferential treatment to one child or the other has long term psychological effects on children. And not just that, within our culture, our grandkids from our son's side are treated better than our grandkids from our daughter's side. Why? Because from our son's side, am I in a This is haram. We must show the same amount of affection to all our children and all our grandchildren. Naturally, we're going to love one more than the other. But our display of affection should always be just. And I come to the end of my talk with a few more points. We must allow our children to choose their own career path. 20 years ago, if your child was not studying medicine, business, or law, your child was a failure. Alhamdulillah, slowly this mindset is changing, but it's vital that we allow our children to choose the path that they want to go on. <laughs> because there are many youngsters who are in careers unhappy because they did it at the request of the parents. And we need to stop comparing our children or the achievements of our children with their peers or with our nephews and nieces. And really, this is a sign of insecurity. We see in our language, ke andar sare barabar ni hone. The fingers are not the same. So it's important that we do not compare our children. Okay, better look, you got a level four and Z go level seven. This has a negative effect on children. Whatever the achievements of our children are, we support them. Allah has made everyone different. Some are gifted academically, some Allah has gifted their hands. Everyone works different. But we must support our children in their career choice. Because when they go to work for the next 30, 40 years, it must be a job that they are happy doing. 
And the next point I want to make is make marriage easy for children. And some common complaints that I receive often is marriages have too high expectations. Imam Sahib, the mahr is too high. And the girl side has said, you must have a house. Three bedrooms, detached. And in many circles, the boy and girl must be from a particular home. Chaudhary can only marry Chaudhary. My friends, when we place all of these conditions on our children and make nikah difficult, then zina becomes easy. Yes, there are certain conditions we must look at to ensure the safety of our children. But we must not make nikah difficult. And friends, we must not force our children to marry whom we want. Uh, through my social media, I get a lot of messages from youngsters. Imam Sahib, subhanAllah, this is the, the essence of bulm. Imam Sahib, my parents want, to, want me to marry my cousin in Pakistan. I refused and they're threatening to give me badwa. I said, I said, badwa ka asal hi hoga. Sarasal zulam. There will be many youngsters in this gathering who are giving dua to the government. Since they raised the threshold from 18,029, they will do it. My father is not saying, marry my niece in Pakistan. They have done something wrong. Friends, if we allow our children to study in university in a mixed mahal, naturally, a lot of them are going to come home and say, we found someone and this is who we want to marry. This is going to happen. So how do we deal with this situation? <coughs> From a young age, in their mid-teens, late teens, <coughs> we inculcate into them that what kind of spouse you look for. Piety, akhlaq, Islam. So when they do come home and say, we want to marry someone, it's going to be someone you approve of. And friends, do not get involved in the marriages of your children. Just yesterday I got a phone call. Imam Sahib had divorced my wife. The mother-in-law was constantly turning her daughter against me. Small, small ikhtilaf. My mother-in-law would make a mountain out of a mole. We have to understand Differences are always going to be there. Somebody sports PTI and someone sports Muni. Lekin phir bhi saath rehne. Ikhtilaf will always take place. But it's the job. Therapy. And many of our youth, and I've, a while ago I posted a snap on my Snapchat in regards to mental health, and I had over 10 youth message me saying, well, now we need help with our mental health. South Asians, especially the Muslim community, are the least likely to access mental health therapy. So as parents, if you know your child is struggling with their mental health, don't blame it on jadu, on tawiz. That's the first thing you do, jadu and tawiz. Encourage your children to access therapy. But I would place a condition that ensure that the therapist is Muslim. Because the world of therapy is a very godless driven therapy. So it's important to have a Muslim therapist who will not try and <coughs> encourage the youngsters to abandon faith, as which happens in some circles. We ask Allah to enable us as children to fulfill our, pa our parents' rights and as parents to fulfill the rights of children.